everybody, Chris Webster here to talk about one of the latest supporters to the Archaeology Podcast Network, The Motley Fool. Now, I've been investing in the stock market through various applications for a few years now, and everybody who's listening to this can benefit from that sort of investment for the long-term financial planning. And also, I know the hosts of these podcasts can benefit because as archaeologists, like none of us get retirement, <laughs> we all have to kind of fend for ourselves. So investing in the stock market is a good idea, but not everybody can do it. And look, we get it. The market is complicated and confusing, and to many of us, it simply doesn't make sense. In fact, where do you even start? Take all of the guesswork out of it with the Motley Fool Stock Advisor. The Motley Fool has been around for over 25 years and has been spot on in recommending some of the world's most important companies before they hit the big time. I'm talking about Amazon, Tesla, Netflix, Starbucks, all before they exploded in value. With their easy to use and super informative service, Stock Advisor, you could join the ranks before they potentially find the next big thing. After all, their average stock recommendation is up over 400% as of April 10th, 2023. And no need to be intimidated by financial jargon or market complexities. As the name suggests, these guys don't take themselves too seriously. Now, finances, that's a different story. Their friendly and relaxed approach has helped over 700,000 people move closer to financial independence, all while beating the market and having fun. New members can access Stock Advisor for only $80 dollars for their first year, a full $110 off the full list price. Don't sit on the sidelines and think about what could have happened. Visit fool.com slash APN to start your investing journey today. That's $110 discount off of $199 per year list price. Membership will renew annually at the then current list price. So again, check the link in the show notes of this episode. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to episode 170 of the Life Ruins podcast, where we investigate the careers of those living a life in ruins. I'm your host, Carlton Gover, joined by my co-host, David Ian Howe. Connor cannot be with us today. He is not dead. He's unzipped. Yep. Yep. But for this week, uh, we are joined <laughs> by uh, Dr. Devin Pettigrew, who is actually realized like one of uh, the leading guests on the show and actually debuted on episode 18.2 as like a as a guest host, not even as a guest proper. We, he came in, interviewed, uh, I think that's 18.2, all we are is Donnie Dust in the Wind, uh, had him back on yeah. immediately after episode 19, episode 75, and also episode uh, 112. So we've like, Devin appears in very pivotal points of this podcast. He's been evenly spaced and we have him on now um, to talk about, he just had three articles drop this year year recently all on weapons ballistics regarding the archaeological record and he is also an incoming professor to what university Devin? Sewell Ross it's in Alpine in West Texas. That's gonna be a fun time I'm really happy for you. Yeah I'm excited they have a really strong wildlife management program and so a lot of what I do is hunting focused and they have really incredible archaeology down there and they want to open up an experimental archaeology lab potentially so it's gonna be cool i think that sounds awesome and pretty suited for you yeah surprisingly well suited yeah and i i hope you definitely argue for these three papers to be on your tenure packet because your first year is golden if you have these three like you're definitely on track so the titles right of these on. articles and we're going to put these in the episode description we have um, reassessing the terminal ballistic performance of trilobite and crodulobate arrow points in the iron age battlefields that's by devin and dr william taylor has been on the podcast Terminal ballistics of stone-tipped atlatl darts and arrows, results from exploratory naturalist experiments. And in that one, you can see a very great picture of me with my belly hanging out looking through a cannon, through a, through a camera, not a cannon. And then the last one is on the non-scalability of target media for evaluating the performance of ancient projectile weapons. And, like, and that's with Devin and um, Dr. Douglas Banthforth from CU Boulder. It was really fun for me just to look through your illustrations, Devin, because I recognize a lot of these things. I recognize your old office space where you had a crossbow set up in the lab. <laughs> and, yes. and and you've been talking about this on the podcast since you've been on. We kind of watched the beginning, like your research back in 2019 as you defended. I mean, now we're, we're looking at like these published peer-reviewed results outside of the uh, dissertation defense media so yeah, right. i mean just kind of walk us through so one of the big ones we'll, we'll kind of wait for the iron age stuff last but when we're talking about pr prior to your work on weapon ballistics how were archaeologists 
studying the effects of uh, projectiles on past human populations, but also in hunting practices. Yeah, sure. So there's a couple different ways. And I think on the last episode I was on, we talked about the differences between a controlled style experiment yeah. and a naturalistic experiment, the controlled one being where you're like in a lab kind of setting, you're trying to isolate some variable or variables of interest. And so it's very kind of artificial, you know, like it's imagine a bunch of guys standing around in the lab coats. That's not the past. The naturalistic style experiment where you're, you can imagine being out of doors, you have actually human users launching weapons. It's really hard to, to control for variables in that setting. So they both kind of have their strengths and weaknesses. Prior to my work, archaeologists have been doing both for some time. And I would say it seemed like, as I looked through the literature, that controlled experiments were becoming more and more popular. And so a big issue I ran into is that in a controlled type experiment, where you're in a lab kind of environment, uh, one of the ways that you control variables of interest is through the targets that you're using. And so uh, people tend to try and use these artificial target media, like ballistics gelatin is probably the best known. And so I discovered more or less that those target media aren't working that well for, for studying the type of projectile that we're studying. They're, they're really quite different from bullets. And so you just can't assume that the same target media is going to work the same way. And in fact, you get pretty astoundingly different results shooting uh, an arrow into ballistic shelter than you do into actual flesh. So that's really the big, the big difference. And then uh, the naturalistic types of experiments I carried out are carcasses. The big difference there is that uh, the way I employed high-speed cameras allows you to track the projectiles that's coming in, track its velocity, and then track how it decelerates as it penetrates through the carcass, and then you get like a forced feedback. So that was pretty, pretty interesting. So, I mean, it just kind of seems like, I mean, I, I use ballistics gel in my experiment just because it seemed like ballistics gel is the medium you use to test penetration. So I assume archaeologists before right. us just kind of assumed the same. But And so did I. Yeah, for my, I used it as well for my master's research. Okay. It's just, yeah, it's supposedly a flesh simulator. I mean, yeah, no, it makes sense. I think I might have mentioned this last time you were on, but Frizen like chewed me out for using ballistics <laughs> gel and not like in a, like a practical experiment. And I was like presenting to the board, I was like, well, I mean, if you want to pay for me to get an elephant to shoot at, like, I'd love to, <laughs> but right. it's like all I could really say. But yeah, you got a bison, yeah. so that's the next best thing. Yeah, it took a lot, a lot of work, but we've done three different bison experiments now. Still hoping for an elephant sometime in the future, but things are going to have to play out just right for that. And yeah, you got to be ready. Pull it off. Yeah. Yeah. The 70s were definitely a different time. Uh, yeah, they were. Well, the logistics alone, like you have to, one, be on a list for the, what, the Denver Zoo or the Bronx Zoo, and then... San Diego Zoo, and then a day later be able to fly out fully stocked with atlatls ready to be experimented with, or else that thing's going to start to rot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everything's got to be ready. Exactly. There was a paper I read, it was never published, but it was one of the most useful atlatl elephant carcass experiments I read about because the guy said, I threw together my kit the day before, and it was like sharpened wood points and stuff and got pretty lousy results in the take-home messages, be ready in case an elephant drops dead at your doorstep. <laughs> I was like, okay, it's so now nice. I have like 40 close points on standby for just in case. But, uh, but you know, the way Frizen did it, he went to Africa during a culling operation, and he actually wasn't that well prepared. He kind of threw together his kit a little bit, and then in the field, he had to break it down to get it onto the plane. And then the field, he had to reconstruct it and had, he ran into a bunch of issues with that. And I think he had seven total 
close points with him. And mm. he made a few shots that convinced him that the weapon would work, but his results aren't that well documented. So, so yeah. um, it, it could be done again, but it's important to get the all the ethical issues lined out and you know find a a good source for a, a fresh carcass. Absolutely. You know what I what I really like about these three articles is how they're they really kind of come as a package deal like they came out close enough together and like you can tell there's different aspects of your dissertation in each one right so like one is basically like the most recent one i don't know if it's the most recent but it was accepted in may of 2023 the target media so you're basically just like here's a whole article on and what you've discussed on this podcast why ballistics gel and and these other variables we need more control over these things why they're not necessarily adequate then you move into you know with your terminal ballistics the stone tipped atlatl darts and arrows like your actual experiments the target velocities and introducing like more methodology and like how do you do this in a, in a non control like in a very naturalistic experiment and then the third is you know kind of a case study of doing this on iron age battlefields like that one kind of threw me for a yeah. loop because when I think of you, I don't necessarily think of Mongols and, right. <laughs> and like Iron Age yeah. points. Yeah. Yes, Scythians. I was like, whoa, okay. And then when I, I saw Dr. Taylor as a co-author, I was like, oh, I, I wonder where the data is, is, is coming from here on this one. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that, I mean, I just think it's just absolutely fantastic. But yeah, so since these, before we kind of like dive well into these, what's, what has the reception been to your articles if if any so far i'm not hearing a lot so hopefully people will get out there and read them they're they're all open access the first two the one about target media and the one about carcass naturalistic experiments are in open archaeology and then the third one on iron age arrow points is in plus one but so far i'm not seeing direct responses and I mean, could you say that some of the ones you were doing were in response to the, I forget the author of, came out last year about the, um, where they were shooting into pottery. Met and Aaron. Points were in effect. Met and Aaron, that's right. Yeah, there have been several experiments at Kent State University in Ohio, shooting into pottery clay as a, a flesh simulant. So I did tests on pottery clay as well as ballistics gelatin. I used a, a synthetic ballistics gelatin that you can melt and recast. And then I tested a variety of different skin simulants because skin simulants, although in firearms terminal ballistics, they're, they're mainly focused on flesh simulants, flesh being like muscle tissue mixed with blood vessels and little bits of fat and stuff, but it's mainly muscle. Mm -hmm. Skin simulants are used primarily in studies of knife stabbings and which is a whole body of literature I got into. I think most of the work is done in England, but they, they're uh, researching this, the efficacy of different knives thrust into to people as a way to have, you know, another line of evidence if you're evaluating a crime scene or if you're trying to protect your police force with body armor, staff protective body armor, that sort of thing. So they use skin stimulants because skin is the most resistive soft tissue on the body. And so the first thing that the knife has to do, aside from clothing or uh, body armor, is it has to defeat the skin. And once it gets through skin, it can penetrate into uh, less resistive flesh. And then especially the, the internal organs tend to be a lot less resistant. So I tried evaluating darts and arrows in those three different categories of media, the two flesh simulants, clay and ballistic gelatin and then skin. So yeah, the testing, all those was in direct response to a number of papers that have come out that have used those types of media. And I guess to follow up with that, I didn't get a chance to read the Iron Age paper. Would you be able to tell just like, like a quick synopsis of, of what that paper was before we dive in? Sure, yeah, there was a, a prior experiment that shot trilobate and bilobate. That's simply bilobate is two blades, and trilobate, trilobate is three blades. Bronze arrow points. 
that were collected from Neo-Assyrian sites, so around 7 to 600 BC, mm-hmm. shot them into pottery clay and discovered that the bilobate points, the two-bladed points, penetrated better into clay. And so it was confusing because around 700 BC, trilobate points enter into the Near Eastern record. They're coming down from the north because they were invented in the north on the Eurasian steppes by presumably precursors to the to the to the Scythians or the Scythians themselves. But in any event, they entered into the Near East. And then they spread throughout the ancient world. So it was confusing as to why, you know, what would cause them to spread or become popular. So I essentially re-ran that test in clay. And then I did a, uh, I did a, an additional test in a really thick, heavy, stiff tooling leather because people were wearing body armor. Mm-hmm. And body armor, soft body armor, especially made of leather, primarily but also fabrics like linen that was very popular in the ancient world and people continue to wear it into the medieval period. So on a battlefield event, a lot of times the arrows are probably going to be having to defeat body armor before they can enter into the body of the combatant. So the leather was just an analog for body armor and I got uh, pretty much the opposite results shooting into leather rather than clay. And those results being that it was tougher to shoot into the leather? Yeah, so uh, stiff leather is, unsurprisingly, it's very resistive. And it's resistive when the broadhead penetrates it, and then it continues to be resistive as the, the arrow passes through it. So we shot in the clay, and when the previous experimenter shot it in the clay, you're capturing more friction on larger surface areas. So if you had attach additional blades, you're just attaching more surface area to your arrow and Mm. it creates more drag and it penetrates less in the leather you do get a little bit extra resistance when a broadhead with an additional blade goes through the leather but it dramatically reduces the drag on the trailing shaft of the arrow okay so you get a significantly better penetration after that initial you know defeating of the leather okay so so the idea is like when these points enter into the Near East from the North, we can't just assume that they are representative of an ethnic group. That's been done. Archaeologists were doing that, uh, I, I think, mostly earlier on, but apparently this has been a continual problem. Uh, if you're on, looking at a battlefield doing battlefield archaeology, you can't just assume that one arrow point represents one ethnicity. Right. There's all Mm -hmm. sorts of problems with that. First off, how do we even identify an ethnicity in the archaeological record when we have enough trouble doing so today? I mean, you know, which ethnicity do people belong to? It's a a tricky problem. But this just adds another line of evidence that, hey, this is a techno-functional, it's a technological innovation on the battlefield. And it's not necessarily just that you're going to want three blades, three-bladed arrow points from now on, because... If you shoot in a different target meter, you get different results. So if you're defeating, you're attacking uh, opponents with shields or different kinds of body armor, maybe in different cases, two blades will be better than three. But uh, certainly three blades became really popular and were just completely adopted by the Roman military and a lot of other, a lot of other folks. Hmm. Well, we got to wrap this segment up. I have plenty of questions regarding that stuff uh, into the next segment. But yeah, Carlton, you got anything? Yeah, we'll be uh, right back with Tevin Pettigrew after these messages. We're going to get into more of the math and have him explain a couple of these very colorful tables. So we'll be right back. Chicken tacos should only be trusted to chicken professionals. That's where we come in. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One comes with pico de gallo and creamy chipotle ranch. And the other comes with bacon, lettuce, tomato, and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Chicken taco experts since now. Order yours today in the Zax Rewards app. Woo, saucy! Zaxby's. The Labor Day weekend sale is on at Tanger Outlets. Score up to 70% off at top brands like Nike Factory Store, Crocs, J. Crew Factory, Gap Outlet, and so many more. 
Refresh your wardrobe with the latest arrivals for less from all your favorite brands this Labor Day weekend. Tanger Outlets, always on trend, always on sale. Plan your trip at tanger.com. Welcome back to episode 170 of a Life Nerds podcast. I'm David Howe. I'm here with Carlton Gover and Dr. Devin Pettigrew. Also, Dr. Gover, should add that. So we we want to move on to the other papers, but I do want to ask, when I typed in trilobate points, the second thing that comes up is your recent paper. So my question would be, one, I'm assuming these were used by horse archers, um, if they're precursors to the Scythians. And two, do you have any idea why that style took off around the ancient world or was it designed for shooting other horses or something or? Well, yeah, if you add additional blades and they, and the arrow penetrates well, you get a a much worse wound, you know, especially like a three bladed wound. It's Mm. really hard to treat that and it's, it's just more deadly. So, so if you're shooting at, at horses, Yes, certainly a horse is on the battlefield. You want to use a big broadhead, and people talked about that in the medieval period in, in Europe. Actually, the longbow is extremely, could be extremely effective at defeating horses. So if you have a cavalry charge at a good group of archers, I mean, that can go very badly for the, the cavalry. As the French learned at Ashmore. As the French, yes, exactly. So yes, broadheads are effective there and three blades can make worse wounds. But what's interesting on the northern steppes, and I can't get to the, into this in too much detail, but these bronze points are essentially copying bone points that came about towards the end of the Bronze Age. And I think they were in use certainly earlier in the Bronze Age, but by the end of the Bronze Age on the steppes, the bone points, these socketed, triangular and trilobate uh, bone bone points were becoming really popular and then they were replaced in the early iron age by bronze points which is interesting that they switched over to bronze but one of the ideas in the in the iron age but one of the ideas here is that to make a three-bladed point from iron is actually very challenging and it takes a lot of effort the romans were using three-bladed iron points so which shows how you know important it was for them to make that style of point from, from iron. But earlier on, they were casting them out of bronze. And so the idea is it's easier to cast them from bronze. And um, if they were working wetter, better on the, the battlefield, that helps explain why they, they spread you know, relatively rapidly. Yeah. Okay. No, that's pretty fascinating. I was watching Kingdom of Heaven the other day and I was thinking too, just when you were talking like the sheer, not even the dead bodies, but you got to pull all of those dead horses off the battlefield as well. And that probably took much more labor or you just left the horses to rot. I don't know, but. uh, Oh yeah. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) My, My thought assumption before that was that you just tried your best not to shoot horses because it's extra money for you when you get those, the other army's horses, but it's kind of unavoidable when, you're, you're in stirrups attached to one. Yeah, I think the tactics just, you know, changed and evolved it during the time to whatever they needed to do. If, if you got to shoot the horse out from under the guy to get the guy, then that's what you do. Yeah. If you can capture the horse, then that's what you do. But it just, you know, it depends on the moment. And so. Yeah. And then like speaking to when, uh, when Dr. Pettigrew was talking about, Triangular points do more damage. Uh, triangular bayonets are like banned by the Geneva Convention because they are like impossible to stitch up. Like lessons we learned from World War One, yeah. you know. So just kind of showing the efficacy of those things. But this is another example. Like you can, your work continues to show. Here are all these assumptions that archaeologists in the field have made about projectile weapons, how we measure them, how we can tell things about the past, and you're like systematically through the scientific method deconstructing their arguments using the math and being like, this is actually how this works, right? So with the Iron Age stuff, you're looking at like, well, the first guy simulated with this clay. This is why clay is not a good indicator for this, right? And then kind of shifting gears here, I wanted to talk more about the terminal ballistics of stone tip atlatl darts and arrows. So that is the conglomeration of several different Experiments. That's the word I was yeah, looking for. Carcass experiments. So the three bison 
the goats. Is the pig data included in this too? Yeah, it's the hog, two goats, and two bison. I haven't. The third bison is is brand new. Okay, so if Devin was on Noah's Ark, there wouldn't be any animals left on the planet. Um, <laughs> no on goats, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing with them, right? And I, and I was very fortunate and privileged enough to take part in those experiments, whether just like holding a camera, getting to throw darts myself, and just being a part of that whole fun process across across the West. But I want to kind of pull everyone's attention to this paper uh, on figure seven on page 13 of Pettigrew et al. 2023, the figure uh, momentum uh, and was it velocity as predictors of penetration? Yes, we're looking at uh, terminal ballistics of stone tipped out little darts and arrows. Figure seven shows kinetic energy and momentum fitted out against the wound surface area and the total penetration depth. And you have a couple different indicators here. So we're looking at arrows, basket maker darts, different types of cane. So I imagine, so what does cane L, cane M, and cane H stand for? Just the weights. So cane okay. H is cane heavy, cane M is mm. cane medium, and then cane light. Oh, okay. And then you have composite. Yeah, those are the composite darts are these very heavy darts I started making to try and increase the sample and improve the, the projectiles. Because the thing about projectiles that people need to remember and that we keep screwing up is that they're extremely variable. Mm -hmm. The same projectile technology will be extremely variable, and you're going to have a significant amount of overlap in their ballistics, so a huge amount of overlap in the kinetic energy momentum of an arrow relative to a dart because you happen to have arrows that are, according to the English from the medieval, from the Tudor period, uh, half pound, (laughs) and they're being shot by bows pulling up to 180 pounds of draw on the battlefield. <laughs> right. And they're penetrating plate metal armor. So you have that arrow, and then you have an arrow that's shot by a little bitty 20 pound Bushman bow that's just tiny. And the point is to get poison into the bloodstream of the animal. Those are going to leave entirely different signatures in the archaeological record, those types of bows and arrows. Uh, you know, but, but that's one weapon technology. So that's a, a problem for us because because we tend to, to kind of essentialize projectile technology as if you can, you know, boil them down to these kind of essential features. Yeah, and like everybody, even in like within the same culture, I'd imagine somebody has their own specific way of wanting their atlatls. And you know, like when we were shooting the ones on that mountaintop, like you gave me that really, really thick, heavy one. I'm assuming was your composite, and like that felt really good yep. to throw, but it was too big for the atlatl itself. Right. But I'd imagine even if the points are pretty ubiquitous throughout like a region and time period, the atlatl shafts could be way longer or thicker depending on what the person wanted to. So. Yeah, I mean, you can have extreme variability in that metal shaft and hold the point more or less constant, or you can do the opposite. You can have a bunch of guys, people throwing metal darts that are all very similar, but the points are all hugely different in size. Mm -hmm. Um, All that works. It's all acceptable. Right. So the problem here that we're trying to deal with in these naturalistic experiments is we're trying to assess the performance of projectile points against that backdrop of variability. So we're trying to use different sizes of of dart shafts primarily. And we could do the same with arrows. Our arrow sample is is much smaller for this, but but the focus was mainly on darts and we wanted some arrows just for comparison. Yeah. So that's why there's all these different sizes of darts in this graph. I mean, I I know the answer to this question, but I, I just wanted to, I'll have you answer it for the audience, but like, the extreme variability of these graphs and why they're so not to say why they're so colorful, but what are the importance of these graphs and like why they're complicated and complex? Cause in your experiment, clearly they need to be. Right. So the point of all the different colors and shapes is to allow the, the reader to pull in a lot of data with one little figure, right. And to try and figure out what's going on to, to see the differences. So, 
as you're looking at this graph, you see kinetic energy, and, and you can actually see that the, the projectiles are grouping pretty well in how much kinetic energy they're carrying. As the darks mm -hmm. get bigger, they carry a lot more kinetic energy. That's not surprising at all because we know from past work that as projectile thrown projectiles get heavier, they become more efficient for people to throw up to a point of diminishing returns where you hit that point of diminishing returns depends on the skill and strength of the thrower. But, um, right. but as a general rule of thumb, they're going to carry more energy as they get bigger. And that's true for single throwers as well as for large groups of throwers. So for, just for yeah. me, a heavier dart carries more energy than a really light one. And what this is showing is that as that kinetic energy goes up, they're penetrating better. Big surprise, but, but, Kinetic energy is the number one variable capturing the penetration and the size of the wound, the wound surface area in our data. Mm -hmm. So so if you're going to hunt a big animal, you're probably, and you do that for a living, you're probably going to adapt a heavier weapon kit. Sure. The uh, figure six as well, like I just want to commend you on the, like the adding the like the spearheads or the atlatl points like with the graft is really really helpful and this is like a beautiful figure and not to mention like Thank you. you're showing all your work on the side and yeah it's i love how the bottom one is covered in bison crap like i remember that point because even though it was a gut shot i looked at that i was like oh that's the poopy point and you got that, <laughs> you <did> that. <laughs> <laughs> this is carlton's handy work here <laughs> Yeah, you had two shots right in a row, Carlton. So actually these shots were three apart, 290, shot number 290, and shot number 293. They, they hit really close together. They certainly didn't hit the same wound channel, but they, they hit pretty close together. And there are two different points, but they're on the same dart. So that was a really good comparison. So yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad I can help. But one of the more like early on table one, right, where you're looking at the bow hunting requirements, is that that's a very big part. And we talked about that with the Metin and all, um, Aaron at all, sorry, the paper where they're just like, well, you can't hunt elephants with these Clovis points because they're firing them off like a 30 pound bow and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we talked about that in that episode. But you have like the list of like, these are the requirements, the kinetic energy and the uh, force and jewels that you need to be able to hunt these different classifications of game. And you have the very large game, which is between 227 and 998 kilograms. Now, um, does a mammoth or mastodon fit within? I don't know what a kilogram is. I speak Merc and I do my weights in <laughs> orders of Big Macs. So I don't know what a kilogram is. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, let's do a conversion real quick. So I know that Fred Bear killed a, African ele a four ton African elephant. At least that was the estimate with a 75 pound bow. So not a terribly heavy draw bow, but he killed it in one shot. And so 1800 kilograms. Yeah. So interesting. That's outside of the, the kilogram range, but these, I can tell you that these ballistics, these recommendation recommendations apply to elephants. Yeah. So I'd have to go back and look at Tom Kaz article as to why he threw the, the upper range at 98. 998 kilograms, but in African countries, these ballistics associated with this very large game category are what they recommend for elephant hunting with a bow and arrow. Because gotcha. you have, in that, you do have two heavy darts, composite number 13, composite number 16. Composite number 13 is only able to do 83 joules of energy, which is below that recommended 88 threshold. Mm -hmm. But the... Yeah, but I stuck it in that, that heavy darts category just yeah. it seemed like but, it belonged there. But then composite 16 is at 112, which like very well exceeds that limit, right? And yeah. that's the one um, – it's like what me and Donnie got similar values on the heavy dart. I remember that thing. That thing sucked to throw. Well, the one you, you threw at Donnie's house, you said you enjoyed it sucked to throw. It was fun to throw, but it was weird. <laughs> okay. Well, the, there's the one you threw up on the mountain, and then there's the one you threw at his house. So the one you threw at his house, you told me at the time that that um, you liked it. That's not correct? I think I'm thinking about the mountain one. One of those wasn't a fun day yeah. to throw that thing. That was the mountain one, yeah. It wasn't as 
it wasn't tuned as well. So I improved it. And that's the one you threw at Donnie's house. So 112 joules of energy is absolutely the the mean that you are getting downrange, about 15 right. yards downrange at, at Donnie's house. And then we were getting some higher values above that, 120, 130 joules. But your mean, your average was was above the the necessary recommended energy for an arrow to kill an elephant. And the arrow that Fred Barry used to kill that 410 elephant had to have been down in like the 60 or 70 joule range or, or lower even. So uh, yeah. it, these are just recommendations. Gotcha. I remember trying to, on the mountaintop, trying to shoot the target while also keeping it in range of the sheet you had on the side so you could track it with the slow-mo camera. But I kept like throwing them, <laughs> throwing them over that. <laughs> Still yeah. hitting it sometimes. Yeah, you were just lobbing over the, the backdrop, which <laughs> made it hard to uh, get any kind of good readings. <laughs> so my bad. I wish I had the radar gun. I mean, because later we got a really sweet radar gun for our second bison. We crowdsourced it, and one of the things I wanted to get with the crowdsourcing was a radar gun so we could compare the velocity from a really high quality radar gun with the high speed camera. So we were able to do that. And uh, subsequent velocity experiments, we used the radar gun and it was, it's phenomenal. It works so yeah. well. Yeah. Oh, that's good, dude. Well, uh, we need to wrap this segment up, but when we come back, uh, we'll talk about the other paper. Ready to level up your career? Text DISH to 44043 now to dive into a world of exciting technician opportunities at DISH. From cutting edge technology to a supportive work environment, DISH offers the perfect platform for your success. Connect with us today to discover how you can be part of a dynamic team driving innovation. Connect today and join the DISH family where innovation meets opportunity. Text DISH to 44043 to kickstart your journey towards a rewarding career. The Labor Day weekend sale is on at Tanger Outlets. Score up to 70% off at top brands like Nike Factory Store, Crocs, J. Crew Factory, Gap Outlet, and so many more. Refresh your wardrobe with the latest arrivals for less from all your favorite brands this Labor Day weekend. Tanger Outlets, always on trend, always on sale. Plan your trip at Tanger.com. And we're back. So real quick, because that uh, paper included an experiment that none of us were a part of. So the, for, so since you arrived at Boulder, I think I took part in your experiments and David and Connor and others were able to, to join in, in one of them. And so that when you're able to crowdsource for that other bison, did you do anything different prior to the other experiments? For the second bison, um, the idea on the second bison was to test. First, we wanted a, a more robust, younger animal because you helped out with the, the first bison, which was a cow, and we wanted to test a young bull. We also wanted it to focus on heavier dart shafts. So I did a lot of prep work up to that experiment, crafting these dart shafts. And then uh, for the third bison, the, the one that we just did, we pretty much continued that protocol but with some some improvements. So what was different about the second one, we actually had a really small crew. So we had to kind of try and optimize our, our output with a small crew. So we used two of the, the kind of older Casio cameras. One was observing from behind, observing the impacts, the exact location of the impacts. The other one was observing from the side. And then in the third bison, we used a really powerful camera called a Kronos 1.4 to observe from the side, and that's capturing the dart coming in and impacting the bison. And the results there are just astounding because uh, you can use, use this auto tracker function and tracker, follow a specific mark on the dart shaft, and it just goes automatically. And then you, you get this force feedback as the, mm -hmm. the dart penetrates and you get some really sweet data. So. So it was definitely uh, really useful to see how those heavier darts were performing, but also to test more robust, younger bison and and just to try out those different cameras. Yeah. No, your equipment's always been pretty pretty sweet for all this. Absolutely. 
Now I'm like curious, like what's the next step with the data, right? Because we see, you know, generally we're talking about the heavier darts are we believe are used first, right? Because that's what people are hunting Pleistocene megafauna with. And as time progresses, then we get lighter darts. Then there's a transition. There's a time where darts, like basket maker darts and arrows are being used together. And then especially in like the United States, uh, indigenous nations within the United States begin just using bow and arrow technology. So what is that transition tracking? Or is there something going on in the environment or the type of game that's being hunted that's kind of shifting this practice yeah i mean so you're bringing up all the questions that we have because we don't know what people were using i mean we can see what adults and darts looked like in the late archaic that are coming out of the southwest we don't know what paleo indian adults and darts looked like all we see are the points Mm -hmm. and we have a problem like we mentioned earlier where archaeologists not always, but they tend to be essentializing these weapons. So they're just saying, oh, this is an outlet dart point, and an outlet dart is X, Y, Z, and that's what it looks like, and that's that. But we suspect if people are hunting really big animals in the Pleistocene, they're probably using a heavier kit. And then later in time, these lightweight basket maker darts that we're seeing in the Southwest, these are adapted to hunting a fleeter prey, smaller prey, probably. And they're, they're hunting, you know, desert bighorns and that sort of thing. So those are the kinds of questions that we have. And how do we see all of that just from stone points alone? When you pick up a stone point, you don't know how it was used. You don't know what the dart it was on looked like. But if you can make replica stone points and use them and see how they perform and see how they become damaged and see how bone becomes damaged at, with these different ballistic profiles, that gives you something to work with that you can then bring that to the archaeological record and, and try and, and draw your data set out a little bit more and, and make some you know, approximations of what a hunting kit looked like in the past. So that's yeah. a big part of what we're trying to do here. Would you ever, given the chance, do a, a live bison hunt or would you be opposed to that? You don't have to answer if you don't want to. I mean, I would hunt a bison with an app little bit. Um, I think ethically, it's just uh, it's something you have to tiptoe around. You know, I right. might do it for for my own hunt. Now, having seen how these points perform, I definitely one of the good reasons to do this kind of experiment is it gives you a sense of how efficacious a, a hunting weapon is, and then you can bring that data to try and determine, you know, is this still something we want to do or not? Um, yeah, you know, you want to do that first on a an animal that, that has just recently died a very rapid death. And, and, you know, I would also point out in these experiments, we're going ahead and we're consuming these animals. So, so nothing is really lost that, that wouldn't have been, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm skeptical or I'm, I would be really careful, really cautious. Yeah. Definitely tasted I, the age on that first bison. and holy shit, was, that, <laughs> was she rugged. <laughs> I, I met a so, guy this spring that had done a bison hunt i believe with the hunt primitive guy oh that's right hunt primitive. he had one. said like he wouldn't do it again because he just felt so like i don't think gross was the word but that was kind of like what he was getting at that you know it's in a confined area it's not like a real hunt and they they yeah. got a great shot and it died like pretty quickly but he was like it's just not not worth it yeah yeah farmed animal is it's not really hunting Mm-hmm. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't recovered bison yet to the extent that uh, you can go find, easily find a, a big wild population that you can legitimately hunt. Right. So, yeah, we need, we have a lot of work ahead of us to, to recover those animals on the landscape. Yeah, absolutely. Man, dude, you just do such cool shit. I'm so fucking happy that you got this new job. <laughs> this is just, it's just really awesome to see all this turn out in this published form and i don't know like i think like you're you're part of a trend of this generation of archaeologists in their fields and their in their foci really going after a lot of this assumed knowledge and like showing like you know this is the work that's been done for the past 40 50 years is is not necessarily accurate because we just assumed the nature of the record and what these tools were used for like my colleague here at IU, he's a zoarchaeologist, and he's like quickly realizing 
a lot of times specimens that are in a box aren't actually what's labeled on the box. And like he was trying to get yes. narrative samples from like Harvard and they wanted 15 uh, rabbits and like even Harvard sample, like five of the 15 were squirrels. They weren't even rabbits. And it's just like, and those are comparative samples that the world uses yeah. to identify yeah. remains in the archeological record. Like, Oh, we know, you know, so it's just like, and you're part of this, like, well, how do we actually know what we know? And we're in this really interesting transition where we had the post processual critique in the late, in the early nineties that said, well, we need to look at things differently, but you're part of this generation that's st still very much rooted in quantitative methodologies to really go back, reapply a lot of, reanalyze a lot of our understanding of the archeological record and be like, no, no, no. If we're going to be scientific, we actually have to use the scientific method and you can't yeah. assume when doing that. And yeah, like it's just in the fact that I don't know, man, like some of my favorite moments of being a grad student are, are with you in random places on a farm. <laughs> <laughs> like, to do it's while, while you guys were in grad school, like just being there for part of this was like, damn, dude, this is to piggyback off what Carlton was saying. Like when you explain archaeology is a science, like your papers are at like the gold standard for like, you know, not just experimental, but like legitimate science. Like it's a myth busters type oh, thing. Man. Looking at everything. You got. Yeah. yeah it's just, blush. it's cool. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, <laughs> Rightfully. Bust, myth busters <laughs> and all their gel, you know, ballistics gel that they use all the time. It's like, well, damn yeah. It. yeah. Yeah. You can use that. I mean, you can use it for firearms. Okay. Uh, and I should, I should just clarify really quickly why that is because if you think about leather, if you think, if you imagine that you have three strips of, of material, you have a strip of leather that's kind of thick, and then you have a strip the same size of ballistic gelatin, and you have a strip of clay. If you pick up those strips in your fingertips and pull them apart, you can imagine that the gel, uh, just like jello, would come apart really easily in your hands. The clay would too, but the leather you would probably, you would probably have a hernia right before you pulled it apart. Uh, so, so the ballistic, ballistic gelatin, and it's been tested for quite a long time for firearms, it's mimicking the density and viscosity of muscle tissue. It's not mimicking the fracture toughness. But for a bullet, because it's traveling at such high velocity and it doesn't defeat a target using a sharp tip and edge, the fracture toughness isn't the main part. You can, you can model bullet penetration use a flu, using a fluid model as if it's traveling through a fluid medium like uh, atmosphere or, or water. And so one of the two main variables in a fluid penetration model are density and viscosity. But we are studying low velocity projectiles that defeat targets using sharp tips and edges. And so they're defeating tough targets, like skin is a very tough target. Uh, leather body armor is a very tough target. They're defeating that using those sharp tips and edges. So so that's why ballistic gelatin just, it, it's not working and the same is true of clay. Yeah. Because there was one moment that you were speaking about how in the high speed you could see that the some, the ballistic gel was like bending before it broke. Like it was absorbing yeah. like arrowheads in particular before it even penetrated. And then it kind of, there's the uh, an elasticity to it where it kind of gets stuck yeah. back in. Like it wasn't even... Act, and just like you said, right, it's, it's not doing what it's supposed to do with the tension. So it's like fucking with right. the penetration depths because it's acting like flubber. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just like it, it doesn't have any of the structure, you know, to make it you if you want to make a collagen based gel, you're, you're rendering collagen out of these uh, tissues, uh, tendon, bone, skin, you're, you're rendering that out in a hot water acid bath, and you're mixing that subsequent, that collagen gel with water, none of the structure, like the collagen fibers and skin, none of that is preserved. So the toughness just isn't there. It's capturing friction. So if you use a smaller point, it can even be a dull field point. If it's smaller than a sharp, larger sharp broadhead, it's gonna to tend to penetrate deeper, whereas you're gonna get entirely the opposite result in a, an animal carcass. Mm -hmm. What do you? Th how how deep do you think a heavy atlatl dart would penetrate a Russian conscript wearing Nerf body? <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> I think we, wait, could, we, we could take a plane trip and go test this uh, quasi legally. <laughs> no, uh, so body armor that protects on a battlefield against a ballistic attack isn't necessarily designed for uh, for something like a knife. That's why now the, the body armor that's being manufactured for like police forces, uh, they, they're trying to have to try and balance body armor that's going to capture both a, a knife thrusting attack and a bullet. Hmm. So if you didn't have that kind of body armor and you had a sharp broadhead on the end of a dart, it might go right through and, and you know right through the body armor into the into the body. So yeah, I don't know how I can't tell you how deep, but I suspect it would defeat the outer layer of body armor and go through the torso and probably stop at the back, the, the back layer of body armor. An at lateral the with a stone body. point? I'm not sure about a stone point, a sharp broadhead. But uh, okay. the, the result we tend to get on the bison is that when they get through the skin and uh, resistance is far less through the torso, they're going all the way through and they're actually stopping and get skin at the back of the torso. Or in some cases, they're penetrating through the skin on the back of the tor- torso. But, but usually, um, they they have shed the, the large amount of energy they need to, to punch through that tough hide on a bison uh, yeah. is shed by the time they get to the back of the torso. Yeah. So, so yeah. I must have missed it then. But like, how, how is it that it can, a body armor could stop a bullet but couldn't stop like a broadhead from going through it? Is it just surface area or like? Pressure. Just, the, the, it's the, the fibers of the body armor because uh, Kevlar body armor, you know, it's a fabric. It's it's stopping kind of a blunt but very high velocity projectile. If you take sharp edges, uh, they're able to cut right. through the fibers. So to make uh, body armor that, that protects against both, they're using this this armor that becomes hard hardened at higher velocities or at a certain high velocity, you, you know, you want the body to, the, the armor to move with your body, especially if you're having to wear it all day as a police, police officer, you're getting hot and sweaty, you need to move around. You don't want it to be, to, to be a stiff, hard material, but that's what you need to shield against a, a sharp object. You see, you want a hard material that's going to dull the edge. So it's like why a trampoline can bounce a bowling ball, but gets cut by a knife. That makes plenty of sense then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So just hire a bunch of Scythian mercenaries to go to Kharkiv or Kiev. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah. If you had access to, oh, the no, I was thinking of Star Wars. <laughs> I mean, yeah, a lightsaber would work too, but right. <laughs> what's your favorite result or what's the favorite thing you've learned or just favorite thing from these papers? The force data that's coming out of the the high velocity or the, the high speed video impacts, that's really fascinating. We're seeing uh, peaks in force at different moments in time. So, so the, the main peak generally occurs when the point is penetrating the skin. Because again, it's the most resistant soft tissue. If you have a, like a, a lot of wool, a thick wool coat, it becomes even more resistant. So we're seeing these high peaks in force, but oftentimes those peaks are occurring when the hafting area of the projectile is penetrating. Mm -hmm. Especially on the third bison that we tested, it still had its winter coat, had this very thick wool coat that was full of sediment. And a lot of the points were actually getting hung up the hafting area and there were like wool was getting lodged in there. Or if you just have a, a hafting area that's kind of bulky, going through that's generally where the peak force occurs and what that mm. means is that unsurprisingly a bulkier haft or a haft that isn't very smooth where that the point is hafted to the force shaft that tends to be a big inhibitor of penetration depth so we don't see the halves in the archaeological record but we do see the basis of the points that correspond to um, how they were hafted and so we should be thinking about how to most efficiently haft points when really efficient hafting would be called on, namely if you're hunting really big prey, and how that's going to be, that information is going to be passed down to us generally through stone points alone. Oh, that's cool, man. I mean, I've known you for what, five years? No, since 2020. So, yeah, you've been at this a minute. No, because he came, when, when did we record Donnie? That was 2019. No, that was 2020. 
That was, was right before COVID. COVID. I remember like people wearing masks at the airport on the way back and I thought I had it. Uh, but but did you meet oh, Devin at, he was there for um, the hell Albuquerque. gap. Yeah. You were at Albuquerque. That's where I met you. That, yeah. That too. But then um, the hell gap oh, yeah. dedication. I wasn't there for that. But oh, anyway. Yeah. You've been working on this stuff for a while and it clearly you're passionate about it. And it just look at, I'm still stuck on this figure with the, points or figure six yeah you're clearly passionate about it so looks great you're starting your new job soon but where can people find you uh i still post occasionally on instagram ar athletal and uh, we have the website i want to start putting some time into that website askmakerathletal.com is the, the website that uh justin and i run so i think we should uh start updating that a bit more but on social media, look for me on Instagram. Okay. It's ar.atlatl or ar underscore atlatl? ar.atlatl, yeah. ar.atlatl, yeah. okay. All that will be in the episode description, dude. Devin, as always, thank you so much. Thank you for continuously agreeing to be on the podcast. Um, really excited to see you at a university. You absolutely um, deserve a tenure track yeah. position. I think you're only like 12 hours away by car ride. <laughs> Still, yes. Yeah, I know I'm the same distance from my home in Arkansas to to Sul Ross as I was from to Colorado. So there's that. Yeah. Uh, life of an archaeologist. Life in West Texas would yep. be fun. I'd visit you there. It's a cool environment. Yeah, you got the the Big Bay National Park is right there. Yeah. <sighs> Absolutely. Cool. All right, everyone, we just interviewed Dr. Devin Pettigrew. You can find him on Instagram at ar.adolatl, as well as um, his website, Basket Maker something. Basketmakeratlatl.com. I don't know why. I, st- I, th- I thought that was it, basketmakeratlatl.com. I thought you froze. Like, I thought your video literally my froze. Brain, my brain did. I blue screened in, in the brain. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, yeah, this has been great. Appreciate you coming on. And guys, rate and review the podcast. Do you want the all shows feed thing subscribe on our our thing and whatever anyway all right see you guys later bye thanks for listening to a life in ruins podcast you can follow us on instagram and facebook at a life in ruins podcast and you can also email us at a life in ruins podcast at gmail.com and remember make sure to bring your archaeologists in from the cold and feed them beer This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.